Well, 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 good morning, good morning, good morning. Today is Wednesday, March 2nd, 2022, and I am Kenny Polkari, your host of the party. So what is it that we need to know? What happened yesterday? What's happening today? What's driving the action? So here's, you, here's what you need to know. Russia continues to push further and further into Ukraine, sending stocks yesterday falling, bond yields falling as prices rising, commodities rising across the board, and he's pushing even further this morning. Joey makes his first State of the Union speech. Oil now trading at $110 a barrel, right? So we can expect gas to have a $5 handle on it any t any day now. And Jay Powell will be on Capitol Hill today and tomorrow addressing the Senate with the Humphrey Hawkins testimony. So investors are gonna be paying very close attention. The crypto suddenly finding a bid, not much of a bid, but certainly better than it has been. They've been under pressure. And what are we having for dinner tonight? We're gonna have the kale pesto with boiled shrimp over linguine delicious and simple to make. Uh, okay, so yes, the economic data was better than expected, yet stocks fell. Bonds rose, sending yields plummeting to end the day at 1.72%. Gold, gold, silver, palladium, copper, wheat, corn, soybeans, all up better than 3 to 5% across the board. The VIX, which is the fear index, was ahead by 10.5%. Oil smashing through $100 a barrel, ending the day up 11% at 106 as the war talk heats up and sanctions begin to settle in. Vlad, not happy that the Ukrainians have not laid down their arms and played dead, but met him and his army straight on, showing, uh, slowing his advance and sending him into a frenzy uh, as the world squeezes him hard. He's miscalculated the economic cost to his latest invasion, failing to anticipate what the West would do and has done both economically and militarily. Economically, the sanctions have targeted the Bank of Russia, right, their central bank, and that has battered the ruble and beaten up the Russian financial system. The ruble losing better than 30% of its value versus the dollar, and the Russian stock market ordered close to prevent a complete meltdown. Russian citizens lining up at the ATMs as they try to trade their rubles for dollars. On Saturday, February 25th, remember, Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission, took center stage and announced that the EU, along with the US, the UK, and Canada would take steps to cripple Vlad's ability to finance his war by banning Russian banks from the international SWIFT system. In addition, they would also impose restrictive measures to prevent him from using his foreign exchange reserves, now totaling more than 600 billion to help soften any blow. Right, and that all created angst on Monday, created more angst yesterday. Uh, by Monday night, by Tuesday night on the East Coast, it was, oh, by Monday night in the East Coast, it was Tuesday morning on, on the other side of the world, right? European and U.S. futures were plummeting. The banking news and the news at multi, that a range of multinational U.S. companies were cutting ties or suspending operations with Moscow hit the tape. Amex, Apple, Ford, Boeing, Dell, Exxon, all joining global companies like BP, Shell, Equinor to show unity with the civilized world. Ports and shippers also closing down access to Russian tankers and cargo ships, putting more pressure on Moscow. Stocks took it on the chin. European markets ended the day lower by more than 2% across the board. U.S. futures suggested in the morning another difficult day ahead for stocks, which is curious since only really about 1% of the S&P 500 companies' revenues come from Ukraine and Russia. But what it tells you is that investors are concerned about the fallout, right? The ripple effects to the global economy and more generally, the chaos created by these geopolitical events. Look, this crisis comes as the global economy is facing the highest inflation in 40 years, forcing global central banks to have to deal with it and consider the pace and frequency of rate increases. Not if they're coming, just the pace and frequency. And that changes almost every day now based on the news. As the day wore on, the indexes weakened, all making their lows at about 3.45 p.m. before attempting to take back some of those losses after it was rumored that China is willing to play nice and attempt to mediate the crisis because Gigi sees how the world is reacting to bullies and, may na and he may not want to endure the same fallout as he considers the Taiwan issue, which is still out there, just FYI. By the closing bell, the Dow uh, gave up 600 points or 1.7 percent. The S&P off 68, one and a half percent. The Nasdaq down 220 or 1.6 percent. The Russell off 40 points, 1.9 percent, and the transports gave back 250 points or 1.6 percent. And then we had Joey take the stage last night at 9 p.m. His first State of the Union speech since becoming president. Now he said a lot of things, so let's just highlight a couple of them. First, he announced 
uh, that the U.S. would join other nations and restrict Russian airlines from entering U.S. airspace. He also said he was prepared to release 30 million or 60 million barrels of oil from the strategic petroleum reserves to help settle oil prices. Well, since that announcement, oil has only gained another 5% a barrel, trading as high as 112 this morning before settling in at $109 at about 10, uh, 5 o'clock this morning. Listen, the U.S. burns 21 million barrels a day. So 30 million barrels a day is good for about 31 hours worth of a burn. Even our friends at Goldman Sachs poo-pooed this announcement as really a non-event, uh, which only sent oil prices higher. What the West needs to do is they need, we need to stop buying Russian oil altogether. The West, meaning US, UK, and the EU, paid Vlad about $500 million a day for his oil. I guess you could argue that the West is then helping to finance this war. So maybe what we need to do is stop buying the oil altogether and start producing our own, while also begging the Saudis to pump more. I mean, you can't tell me that oil at plus $100 a barrel isn't worthwhile for US producers to produce. That makes zero sense. Oh wait, I forgot. The progressive left won't have any of it. Instead, they call it extortion and corporate greed. They're still waiting for the windmills in the sun to generate the power we need as they sue oil producers for price gouging during the COVID crisis and now the geopolitical crisis. No matter that WTI is up 66% since January of 2021, it's really called supply and demand. It's Econ 101. You usually, you usually learn that in your first year of college. Joey also made comments about the economy, about immigration reform, but let's leave those comments alone, right? You can find them on YouTube if you missed his speech. I'd rather not, I'd rather not get into it in this video. We can certainly talk about it at another time. Of the 11 S&P sectors, only energy saw gains. The XLE up 1.1%, leaving it up 28% year to date. Financials got punched in the face, the XLF falling 3.7%, leaving it down 5% year to date, as investors are now betting that the Fed will not act as aggressively to curb inflation. Think raising rates uh, as this geopolitical crisis unfolds, right? Tech lost 2%, consumer discretionary down 1.5%, communications down 1.3%, industrials down 1.5%, basic materials down 2.5%, right? So across the board, it was kind of an ugly day. The value trade, the SPYV, fell by 1.5%, while the growth trade, SPYG, fell by uh, also 1.7%. The hedges all rising with this turmoil, right? The VIXI up 10%, uh, the DOG up 1.7%, PSQ up 1.6%, and the, and the uh, SNH, which, SH, which is the S&P short, was up 1.6%. This morning, U.S. futures are in, were in the red, but have since turned green as the sun readies to rise over the Atlantic. Maybe it's the idea that China is going to make good on its offer to mediate, or maybe it's the news that more U.S. companies are cutting ties with Moscow. Uh, or maybe it's the news that the Kremlin revealed that Vlad is suddenly ready to resume diplomatic talks with Ukraine. I say, kick him a bit more. Anybody else? At 6 a.m., Dow futures are up 200 points. The S&Ps are up 26, the Nasdaq up 88, the Russell was up 12. And what I think is just a dead cat bounce. The Russian convoy continues to make its way to Kiev, and surely this isn't going to be helpful. Bombs going off all over the place, if you heard this morning on the news. Investors keeping a keen eye on what this crisis will do today and what it will do to inflation, the commodity supply chain, and the economy. Joey's comments on inflation suggested that companies need to lower their costs not their wages. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's good, but maybe Joey doesn't realize. Just to be clear, wages are a part of the cost structure. So how do you lower, uh, and, and, and the question is, how do you lower your other input costs when prices everywhere are rising at a 9.7% rate, the latest PMI report, causing CPI to rise at a 7.5% rate, the latest CPI report? I mean, he told them to lower their costs, but didn't suggest how they might do that. Is that because Joey's never run a business, so he doesn't really know what rising input costs mean? I mean, I'm not suggesting that wages come down, but I'm confused about how he thinks companies can lower their costs when everything is rising. Again, I'm just asking for a friend. I'm not asking for me, just so you know. <laughs> In any event, the Eco data today does include the ADP employment report, and it's expected to show an increase of 375,000 new jobs versus last month's initial estimate of minus 310,000 new jobs. Surely that number is going to be revised upwards today, but let's see. Mortgage apps are also due out and are expected to be weaker again as mortgage rates have climbed significantly in percentage terms. It's up 30% since December. 30-year rates are up 30% since December, and that's after they fell 12% 
uh, last week and this week since this invasion began, which means that they were up 42% as of last week. Tomorrow brings up the usual suspects plus the market services. PMI expected to be 56.7, a solid number. ISM services, PMI 61.1, a solid number. Factory orders up 7 tenths of a percent. Durable goods up 1.6. And then on Friday, we get the non-farm payrolls report, and that's supposed to come in at plus 403,000 jobs. I expect that last month's 467,000 jobs is also going to be revised higher, I would imagine. Unemployment will come in at 3.9%. Manufacturing to produce 24,000 new jobs, while average hourly earnings are up 5.8% year over year. Jay Powell is to appear on Capitol Hill today and tomorrow to deliver his Humphrey Hawkins testimony. Today he'll be in front of the House Financial Services Committee, tomorrow in front of the Senate committees. The ongoing conflict threatening to stoke inflation by disrupting the flow of key resources, think grains, energy, and metal. And this is just another issue for the Fed to consider. Investors are now pricing in 25 basis point move versus what was expected to be 50. In any event, this is not gonna be a smooth transition no matter how you look at it. So prepare yourself for uh, potholes ahead. Um, inflation is set to worsen, right? Because of this crisis, it was already bad, but it's only gonna get worse. Um, so can he really raise rates six or seven times in this environment to combat it? While it might be the right thing to do, it may not be the smart thing to do, but we're about to find out. The first, uh, the FOMC meeting is, uh, uh, you know, next week, March 15th and 16th. European markets like U.S. futures are higher in what also feels like a dead cat bounce as well. Surging oil and gas and coal prices across Europe are not good. Increasing food commodities across Europe are not good. But markets have gotten themselves into a short-term oversold position, so an occasional bounce would be expected. At 6.30 this morning, the FTSE was up 7 tenths, the CAC 40 up 3 tenths, the DAX was flat, Eurostox was up a half a, uh, half a percent, Spain was up 4 tenths, and Italy was down 3 tenths of a percent. OPEC meets today and is not expected to increase production based on this latest crisis. But maybe that changes, we'll see. Expect oil is gonna to continue to advance. No matter what happens, I think the price is just gonna cause it to continue to advance. Uh, Cause I don't think OPEC's really gonna flood the market with oil. Cryptos which have been under pressure have uh, and have not been seen as a hedge suddenly found a bid yesterday and remain in the plus column this morning. Bitcoin is trading now above 40,000 or 44,000 and Ethereum is trading just over 3,000. Those up from much weaker numbers uh, earlier in the week. The S&P closed at 43.06, down 68 points after testing as low as 42.80, which brings us close to the January 24th lows of 42.22, but still 170 points from the February 24th low of 41.14. What is key is that you recognize we were in that 41.14, 44.60 trading range. 41.14 is a low from last week, 44.60 to 200-day moving average trend line. I do expect that we will need to retest the February 24th low before this is over. And recall, a failure there at 41.14 could see the S&P trade as low as 38.50 before finding any support, and that would represent a 20% move off the January high. If there's any perceived movement on any diplomatic conversations guided by China or anyone else, and those conversations prove to be fruitful, then you better expect you're going to see the markets move higher both swiftly and aggressively. Sellers will disappear and prices will skyrocket. If they're fruitless, then the move lower becomes much more of a reality. Remember, you should always stick to the plan. Don't veer. Call me to discuss if you want or call your own financial advisor. So what are we having for dinner today? So we're going to make kale pesto, uh, and you're going to throw in some boiled shrimp. You're going to boil it right in the water with the, uh, with the pasta. It's really simple to make. One pot, it's very good. Kale is known as the queen of greens, and it's gaining wide popularity as a veggie with rich nutritional value, health benefits, delicious flavor, blah, blah, blah. Eating a variety of unprocessed green veggies is also great for your health. You can make pesto sauce out of almost any veggie, so making kale pesto is just another way to enjoy this. All right, so you want to start with the pesto sauce. It's easy, like any pesto sauce. You need the fresh kale, olive oil, pignoli nuts, parmigiana cheese, garlic, and salt. In the food process, you want to blend all that together, so two cloves of garlic, a little bit of a salt, enough oil to blend it, a couple of handfuls of Parmigiana cheese and the kale, put it in there, make a bunch of it. When it's blended, you can keep adding more kale to it to keep making more. Um, when it's done, add in a handful of pignoli nuts, blend it again really quickly, and then transfer it to a bowl and just set it aside. Leave it on the counter, do not put it in the fridge. Now, you've got your pot of salted water, you're gonna add linguine, cook it for about five minutes. After about five minutes, you want to take your cleaned and deveined 
uh, shrimp, large shrimp, not the, not the jumbles, just the large shrimp. Throw them right in the pot with the salted water, bring it back to a boil, um, and then boil it for another three or four minutes. Taste the pot, the, pink, the, the shrimp will turn pink. Taste the pot to make sure it's al dente. Strain it all, just pour it all into the strainer, saving a mug full of the water you know. Um, then pour it all back, then put the strained pasta and shrimp back in the pot, add a little bit of the water, stir it around, let the pasta absorb the water. Now add in, uh, now add in the pesto. Right, take a couple of spoonfuls of pesto, add it in there, toss it, to make sure it's all coated. You might add another tablespoon of pesto just because you want to make sure the pasta is coated and the shrimp is coated. You want to serve this in warm bowls when you're ready with uh, freshly toasted uh, garlic bread, right? It's really great with this. And, and then choose a nice white wine. You can do a nice Sauvignon Blanc with this if you like, but you know me, I'm going for the Pinot Grigio Santa Margarita. Remember, always have extra cheese on the table for your guests, and if you want, they want more pesto sauce, you can certainly add another dollop if, uh, if it's not enough for them. In any event, it's a simple dish to make. The whole thing takes maybe 20 minutes start to finish. It's one part, so it's an easy cleanup. Uh, in any event, look at this. The sky behind me is blue, 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 which suggests it's going to be a beautiful day here in South Florida. So we can only hope that it's going to be a good day in the markets. Until tomorrow, take good care.